before you this morning how good it is to know the true and living God Father we pray for those who are gathered here in your name we pray that each of us might be drawn near to you we pray that if there's someone here who has a special need that they might bring it to you and Father we pray that if there's someone here who needs some counsel some wisdom from heaven that they might seek that wisdom from you. Lord, we pray that as we share together that you might be lifted up, magnified in our hearts, our minds, and our daily lives. We pray that those, as we leave this place today, that we will walk in the light of your truth and that we will bring glory and honor to your name. And Lord, that we would share the gospel of grace with those we come into contact with. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Last week we shared together from Philemon, and um, some of you may uh, have pronounced that Philemon, but it uh, actually the Greek is Philemon. And, but uh, anyhow, uh, we don't always pronounce everything in English the same either, do we? You know, some some say you guys, some says you guys, some of it's y'all, some of it's you all. So we've got all kinds of variations in, in even in English. So I wouldn't get too mixed up or upset uh, if you don't always pronounce the names and things of these individuals in the word exactly like um, you think they ought to be. Philemon. We talked about, this is a book of faith, family, and forgiveness. In fact, one of the leading verses in this passage is Paul's appeal. He says, I appeal to you on the basis of love. I appeal to you on the basis of love. Let me give you a brief review because we did speak from this passage uh, of this uh, letter last week and some of you are back in town and So let's kind of bring you up to date. Paul was under house arrest in Rome when he wrote this short letter to Philemon. It is actually of Paul's letters. It was his briefest letter in the New Testament. And at the same time, he wrote to the Colossian church. And the Colossian church actually met in the house of this man and his wife, uh, Philemon and his wife, Aphia. Now, while Paul was under house arrest, he met a runaway slave named Onesimus and led him to faith in Christ. How they came to meet, we're not told Uh, in the scriptures. We don't know exactly how God arranged that to happen. But what we need to remember is that Colossa was actually a thousand miles from Rome. And so he made his, uh, this Onesimus had made uh, a great, great journey uh, getting away from the household of Philemon. Now Paul, it seems, encouraged Onesimus to go along with a man by the name of Tychicus, uh, and he agreed to, to do so. Tychicus was going to take the letter of Philemon along with the Colossian letter that we found in the New Testament, the book of Colossians. He was going to carry that back to the city of Colossia. And uh, Onesimus, of course, had run away from Philemon and apparently even taken uh, some of his possessions with him. And in that society, Philemon had the legal authority 
to have Onesimus flogged, imprisoned, or even executed in that society. Now, a man by the name of Epaphras is thought to have begun the Colossian church, but Epaphras was at that time a fellow prisoner in Rome, a thousand miles from his, quote, pastorate in the city uh, uh, of the Colossian city. And um, he was there praying for and perhaps he even went there to seek some counsel, some of the issues that Paul dealt with in his letter to the Colossians, probably came from information that uh, Epaphras had brought to him about some issues they were dealing with. And, and perhaps he went initially to uh, seek the apostles' counsel on the matter. And so Paul sent the letter of Philemon along with the letter to the Colossians by the man named Tychicus. I want us to begin, I want us to just read this chapter together, and then uh, I want to highlight some things, especially uh, the last portion of the, the chapter. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. By the way, it's very likely that Timothy was the one who wrote the words, uh, sort of as, you might say, Paul's secretary. And Timothy was writing the words, and, and we're going to find that at one point, Paul actually took the pen from him and made a, made a special note. To Philemon, our dear brother, friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold in or and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would like to have keep I would like to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing more. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Notice this about Philemon. Paul mentions Philemon's faith in the Lord Jesus and his love for all the saints. And this was demonstrated by his hospitality in providing a place for the church to meet in his home. 
Now imagine that. Remember, during that time, it was at least the third century before there were any actual, quote, church buildings constructed. And so the churches met in people's homes. And Philemon and Aphia opened up their home and made that a meeting place for the local church. Now, if you could imagine, you say, well, uh, what's the big deal? Well, let me ask you something. I know a couple here that opened up their home to actually begin this congregation uh, several years ago, back in fact in 1998, in July of 1998, uh, Butch and Joanne opened up their home so that this church could get established. And we began to meet there until, of course, we outgrew that facility and had to move to other places on a couple of different times until we finally landed here. But let me say, can you imagine if we were gathering in one of our homes instead of in this facility? Now, I'm not just talking about how cramped the space might be, but I'm talking about what it would, what it would be on the host family. In other words, the, the, the things that that would, would incur to them making space, providing, cleaning up after everybody left, all of these things. And yet Philemon and Aphia did that week after week, time and time again, whenever the church would meet together, they showed this hospitality because they had a love for the Lord and a love for his people. And his faith in the Lord and his love for the saints was demonstrated by this action in their behalf. But also, it was demonstrated by the testimony of others who knew him. Because Paul says, I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. And so there were others uh, who noticed the faith of the Lord Jesus. I'm sure you've probably heard the uh, illustration before. If you were called before a judge and uh, you were... The charge was you were a Christian. Would there be enough evidence to prove the charge against you in your life that you really are a believer? Well, there was in the life of Philemon. And in fact, others had seen and noticed and, and really were willing to share their confidence in his faith and the demonstration of his love for all the saints. But also... It talks about in verse 7, it says, You, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. In other words, in his encouragement to the hearts of the saints. Let me ask you something. Remember, when we look at the Bible, let's not just look at what happened then. Let's try to understand what happened so that we have the right context. But let's also say, God, why do you want this? Why do you want me to read this? Why do you want me to think about this? And so that means that I have to ask myself, and you need to ask yourself some questions. And one of those questions is, is could, could that statement be said truthfully about you and about me? That we have refreshed the hearts of the saints. You say, oh yeah, pastor, sure, okay. Give me some examples. I'm not, I'm, that's rhetorical. Don't try to do that. Um, but give me some examples. How have you done that? How have you endeavored to refresh or encourage the hearts of the saints? Now, there are many ways to do that. Um, but, uh, and in fact, one of the, one of the, simplest ways to do that is you got to get together with them on a regular basis, right? Because when you don't, that is discouraging to your brothers and sisters, not encouraging. But he was an encouragement. He refreshed the hearts of the saints. Are you an encourager or a discourager? I guess we, we could ask that question of ourselves. But notice then in these next verses, beginning in verse 8, Paul's appeal to Philemon. Now he's, he's introduced himself. He has uh, expressed his appreciation of Philemon and his family. 
And now he says, therefore. In other words, brother, you have faith, an active faith. You have a love for, for the saints, the people of God. And you have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, in other words, on this basis, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. And so we see that Paul had the apostolic authority to order Philemon to do what he ought to do. That means to do what was the proper or right thing to do. You say, well, wait a minute. How did Paul, where did he get that authority? Well, the Lord Jesus gave him that authority. And in fact, he had used that authority in various disciplinary matters from time to time in congregations where there was trouble and that trouble hadn't been settled. And so he had to step in. But here, he says, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I know what you need. You know what you need to do. And I could order you to do that and to deal kindly with, with Onesimus. But such an appeal on his part really might lead Onesimus to a motive to avoid the consequences of failing to do what is right. Do you know, I'm, I'm afraid sometimes that's how we, we respond to what we know is right, isn't it? Sometimes we respond simply because we know we ought to do what is right. In other words, we respond because we know it is our duty, our responsibility. But there is a higher level, a better motive than duty alone. And that motive is love. Love. And that is, of course, what Jesus called the hinge of all. God's commandments. The hinge of all our duty is love. Uh, you remember Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he says, faith, hope, and love or charity, but well, the greatest of these is what? Love, charity. And so Paul said, I could have appealed to you on that basis, but uh, that's, that's not what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love. Now, you have demonstrated your love for all the saints, all the saints. I find it interesting. Now, uh, think about this. Do you think that Paul was referring to all the Christians who had been voted in as, as a, quote, saint? Who had been determined by the church to be a saint? No, no, no. A saint means one that's set apart, set apart for God. And if you're a Christian, indeed a true Christian, one who had been born again, and you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, you are one of the saints, according to the scriptures. And so he said, you have a love for all the saints. And then he says, as he makes this appeal on basis of love. He says, you have a love for an old man who is now a prisoner of Christ. Now, we don't know exactly how old Paul was. In fact, to me, in my mind at that age, he was probably a young man because he was probably eight or ten years younger than I am right now. He was probably around 60 years old. But why would he be, call himself an old man? Well, if you remembered all of the trials and struggles, I mean, he had been stoned and left for dead. He had been shipwrecked on three occasions. He had been beaten with 39 stripes several different times. He had traveled by foot uh, many, many miles. He, his body was high mileage and he probably looked a lot older than he actually was in years. And not only that, but Philemon knew why his appearance was so antiquated, if you will. Because of his service to Christ. And in fact, he was actually in prison 
on house arrest at this time because of his testimony and witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul appeals to him on the basis of his love for all the saints and for this old gospel preacher who is now a prisoner. And he wanted his love and his response to be something that was spontaneous and not forced. We read about that in verse 14. I do not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. He wanted him to be, uh, he wanted him to be motivated by love. And so he says this word. And then we notice Paul's appeal on the basis of love. He says, you know, you owe your very life to me. And what did he mean by that? Most likely Paul had actually led Philemon to saving faith in the Lord. And so Paul is saying, look, I appeal to you on the basis of love. And you know, you said... And you're, the, what I know about you is that you love all the saints. And then here's where he gets to the deal. He says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Now, that's interesting because in the original text, in the Greek language, Onesimus is not mentioned until the very last thing in verse 10. In other words, I appeal to you for my son who became my son while I was in chains, comma, Onesimus. That's, more, that's a literal translation. Okay. I appeal, well, why is that, why is that significant? I think it's significant because what has he said? He has appealed for his son who became a son and becoming a son, what does he mean? In other words, he became a Christian. He became a follower of Christ. And therefore, whose family is he in now? He's in the family of God. Whose family is Philemon in? He's in the family of God. So what he's saying here is I appeal to you for my son, who of course, being my son, who came to me while I was in chains, is now your brother in Christ. Onesimus. Ooh, what if he had said Onesimus first? I don't know. What might have gone through the mind of Philemon? Oh, that scoundrel. That guy, that, he, that guy he, he took from me, he, he ran from me. How did you ever find him? No, that wasn't Paul's appeal. Paul is saying, I'm appealing to you on the grounds of Onesimus' conversion to Christ. He became my son while I was in change. Formerly, he was useless to you. And it's interesting that Paul uses this term because the, the name Onesimus means useful or profitable beneficial. That's what his name actually means, Onesimus. And so he says, formerly he was useless to you. He didn't live up to his name, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. Why? Because he is family. God has changed him. And in fact, he's changed him so much. I'm sending to him to you, but I would like to keep him with me. Why? Because he's become such a close friend, such a fellow worker. He has demonstrated his confidence in the Lord and his love for Christ and his people. And I can use, he's been a benefit, a help. He's been useful to me. And I know when he comes back to you, he will do just the same. You'll find just the same. Because you see, I'm sending him back to you, but Onesimus could not have been forced by Paul to return. 
That means Onesimus was going to go a thousand miles back to a place that he didn't know for sure how Philemon would respond. He didn't know, but he went. He went because he knew it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. And so he went. Notice this. Paul also reminds him in verse 15 and 16. He said, perhaps the reason he, Onesimus, was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. In other words, Paul offered Philemon something to consider. He said, perhaps, maybe God's sovereign grace works through human affairs. Maybe the lawless acts of Onesimus were not excused by God, but they were used by the Lord, just as God used the treachery of the brothers of Joseph and refashioned it to accomplish the saving of many lives. God has taken what was wrong, and He didn't excuse the wrong, but He used it. He used the event to transform the life of a man who later was a Uh, According to tradition, we don't have any information in the Bible itself about it, but according to tradition, Onesimus is believed to have been one of the pastors serving at the Ephesian church. Onesimus may have run a thousand miles away, but God's grace found him. And Philemon would receive more than he lost upon Onesimus' return. He would receive a valuable worker, a friend, and a spiritual brother, a member of his family. But you know, probably all of us looking at this, we think, well, yeah, that was, that was the right thing to do. That was the right thing to do. That was the loving thing to do. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, Sometimes we have opportunities to demonstrate that same kind of love when somebody has taken advantage of us, spoken ill of us, and yet our response and our willingness, our readiness, our spontaneity, you might say, almost needs to be forced upon us. Because we have not... It's, it's, you see, it's, it's not as simple as we seem to think when just reading about it. Yes, it's the right thing to do. But is the right thing always the easiest thing to do? No, it isn't, is it? We know that. It's always the best thing to do, but it isn't always the easiest thing. But Paul has confidence that Philemon is going to make the right decision. And why did he? Because He knew of Philemon's faith in Christ. He knew of his love of all the saints. And he knew that somehow God was going to speak to him and that Philemon would do the right thing. But notice something else that Paul said. Paul said, you know, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Isn't that interesting? He says, if he's done you any wrong, owes you anything, charge it. To me, and then, and then he takes the pen from, you might say, the, the writing instrument from Timothy, and he says, I'm going to write this with my own hand. I will pay it back. In other words, I'm going to give you an IOU. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. And then he says, refresh my heart in Christ. You remember what he said earlier? You, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Now he says, I need that refreshment. I need that encouragement. You do what needs to be done here. But I think it's interesting. 
that we find Paul is ready to pay for Onesimus' debt to Philemon. Paul asks Philemon to welcome Onesimus as he would welcome Paul. He states that he will assume any indebtedness created by Onesimus. Man, I just can't read that without thinking of how Christ paid our debt. He assumed our indebtedness. And not only that, but now we can come to the Father because of Him. And the Father will receive us. Why? Because of Him. He receives us through Him. Just as this man, Onesimus, Paul says, receive him just like you would receive me. And and isn't that interesting? That's how the Father receives you. When you pray, you don't have to go through this person or that person. It's okay for for us to pray for each other. But we don't have to. We can go directly to the Father. Because of Jesus, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly, not not arrogantly, but forthrightly, knowing that God will listen to us because He loves us. And He loves us because He loves the Son, and His Son took our debt. He assumed our debt, and He gives us His standing. He makes us an heir with Him, a joint heir with Him. I don't know if all that's getting through to you, what that really means. But I hope that you'll think about it and you'll realize, you'll realize what Jesus has done. And Paul has really just demonstrating, I, I, I can imagine that Paul fought back to, to the road when he was smitten. Having been a, a hater of Jesus and his followers, having done everything in his power to upset them and to ruin their influence and wreck their lives, even take their lives in some instances. And yet, now he sees where, where Jesus came. He says, Paul, I've taken your place. I've taken your place. And I think that Paul undoubtedly thought of that in this situation. He says, that's what God did with me. Will you do that with Philemon? Will you receive him as a family member? Faith, family, and forgiveness. You see, we may have diverse backgrounds and roles in life. We may have different abilities that distinguish us somewhat in society in which we live. But there's no distinction in the value of every family member in God's household. No distinction. He loves us all. He loves us all. And each one becomes a part of God's family on the same basis not by anything that we are, not by any advantages that we possess, not by any deeds that we do, but by grace through faith in Jesus. And every member of God's family is to be motivated by the royal law, and that is this, love your neighbor as yourself. The readiness to forgive others and to demonstrate mercy is part of that law. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your holy presence today, I pray that your word might strike a deep, resounding chord within our hearts and our minds. I ask, O Father, that the same faith and love of the saints that was demonstrated in the life of Philemon might be reflected in the lives of those who are present here today. I pray, Lord, that the same attitude, the same family family spirit that Paul encouraged will be experienced among every Christian, everyone in the family of God, 
And may it not just be a head experience, but may it be a life experience. Dear Lord, if there's someone here who has been injured in some way by someone else, whether they're here or at some other place, I pray that you will help them to find it in their hearts to express the love that Jesus expressed when he gave his life for us on Calvary. And I ask this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.